Okay, so this morning we started we started our discussion on Ampere's law, uh, which is half of one of the Maxwell equations. And what does it say is that if you have certain currents running around, and you have a path, you choose a path which which is just a line or, or, or a closed line and you have those currents they pass through the area which is from KD so, so you have this line P and Line P is making a surface, okay? and you have currents which are passing through that surface at different points. So those currents should should really cut the plane which is defined by this path P. So the, the thing you can say about the magnetic field on this path is that if you take P and take a dot product of the dis distance, so any small distance ds along the path and if you integrate it for the whole path then this is equal to u naught which is a constant multiplied by the i enclosed the total i enclosed within that path so you only get so once you know all the currents which are passing through you add them up and if you add them up you multiply it by mu naught, then what you get is the in this integral along that path. Now the question is what is the magnetic field on that path, at a certain point on that path. So you have to be a bit careful here, how do you find the magnetic field. So for that you need to look at the symmetry of the problem. And what do I mean by symmetry of the problem is that, that in this integral Along the whole path, the B should be of a constant magnitude. If it is not of a constant magnitude, this integral won't give you information about the magnetic field. So that's something which is important while using Ampere's law. So symmetry is important along that path. And if you have symmetry, only then it will give you the magnetic field on that path or any part of that path which you choose. So, for example, this morning we took a wire which was a big wire of a certain radius r. And if you want to find the magnetic field close at a certain point, then you choose your path P, which is called as the infinite path, in such a way that the magnetic field magnitude along the path is same everywhere. And if that's the case, then you can find this Ampere's law, find the magnetic field at the location of the point P at which you, or Q at which you want to find the magnetic field. This is what we did this morning. So, we already found or tried using Rio Sapa the magnetic field due to a coil, a current coil. And the magnetic field turned out to be, I plotted it several times, something like this. So in, in the middle, you have more or less a uniform field inside the wire, and the direction of the field is given by the right hand rule. So if uh, your thumbs are around the current, then uh, your fingers are around the current, and the thumb will give you the direction of the field inside the coil. So, you have more or less uniform field here. What if you want uniform magnetic field for a large range of distances? 
So what you have to do is you have to stack many of such coils together to make another structure. So you have a magnetic field which is more or less constant. So whenever we say that we have a char moving charge in a uniform magnetic field, how do you make the magnetic field? So that would be the answer to that. So what you have is, so one more thing, I I'll always draw this this like a loop, of course you would have some current going into the loop and coming out of the loop. So you would have current which is going out on this side and current which is coming out. So this loop is an approximation of such a circuit. So if you have, you can make another circuit like this, for example, and current which is going in and current which is going out. What you have in such a structure which is called a solenoid are many such loops close, closely stacked together. So if you have a field, a current which is going like this, like this, like this, and on. So that, that's what you have. So the magnetic field inside, I would suppose, should be more or less uniform. So how to find the magnetic field inside? So the answer would be, we can use an, the law. But to use the law, first we have to find the symmetry of the problem, or the symmetry of the problem. So let's say if this distance is L, and you have N, number of those current loops inside which are very closely packed together. So what I do is I take a certain part of that. Uh, so out, so you have a current coming out and a current which is going in, out and in, out and in. So if I draw the upper surface, a part of the upper surface, what I have is a current which is coming out, current coming out, current coming out. And on the lower side, you have current, which is going in, current, okay. And this continue on this side, and on the other side. So that's that's how you can visualize this. What should be the field due to those structures? So you can say, okay, use the right hand rule. So into the board is the current, so the magnetic field. around each of this. So, so that's how, how it is for the lower. You can similarly draw it for the upper branch as well. So a few things are very striking. So you, you see here, the line which is force field line which is coming downward and field line which is coming up. So those two they cancel out together. You have the, the same situation here, you have the same situation here, and the same situation on this side. So the lines, the field lines which are in this direction, they are cancelled out by the neighboring line which is in the opposite direction. So what you are left with is a situation like this, that you have or less some lines there, lines there, and the other lines disappear. So what you can say in magnetic field should be more or less of the same magnitude if the distances from the wire to the line is exactly the same everywhere. So you might have three this direction. Similarly, from the upper one, you would have field again in the same direction. So if I draw a line here, along this line, I would expect a constant magnetic field. So that's where the symmetry of this problem lies. So if I draw an infinite path like this, this should give me a good symmetrical problem to deal with. And I can say that the magnetic field 
along this path or along this path should be more or less constant. Okay. But to find the vector, so along this path you would have magnetic field inside, and along this path you have a magnetic field outside the solenoid, and on this path you won't have any magnetic field because those components cancels out. Uh, but before I solve this, I am going to solve another problem with the same structure, but for a somewhat different like this. This I call as P1, this I call as P2. This distance from the center, this edge is A, and this center, this edge is B. This completely outside. And let me find the magnetic field across this one. So let's say you have a magnetic field along this line, which is, I would call a magnetic field at a distance A from the center of the wire, uh, of the line. And magnetic field along this line would, be, would have a certain magnitude at B. So because this line is a distance A along path P2 equals to mu naught divided by I enclosed in this path P2. What is the current enclosed in this path P2? What is the current enclosed? This is equal to 0, so I can say the right hand side is equal to 0. What will be on the left hand side? So I have to integrate the B, the B at this path the B on these two paths is 0, so what I am left is B in this path multiplied by this minus the B in this path multiplied by that. So what you would have is B at the path number A multiplied by L minus B, B multiplied by L and this equals 0. Minus because you are moving in the other opposite direction in the lower path. So that would be your total integral and that would be equal to 0. So what I can say is that the magnetic field at A is equal to the magnetic field at B. True? So what if I, this is an arbitrary path which I have chosen. What if I take the second part an infinite distance away? True. What would be the magnetic field at this B point now? Zero. If this is zero, the A is zero. We haven't found that yet. We haven't found that. Okay, it doesn't make sense. So let me let's try to make sense of it. You have a magnetic field here, which is in this direction. This makes sense. What would be the magnetic field at, let's say, at this point due to that current? So let's say, on this, so you have out of the wire, so you would have a magnetic field due to this wire, something like this, with a bigger. What about that thing? But this would be in this uh, which direction? It would be in that direction. What would be magnetic field because of this? It would be only like this, but again in this direction. What about this? Again in this, in this direction. So what's happening there? You have magnetic field due to the near wire in this direction, you due to the small wire are in the opposite direction. So and because this at this point you only see the near coil, you only see this coil, but for the other coil, you see the field due to all the neighboring ones, not only one. So those cancels out, and you have a net field zero here, and a net field zero on the other side as well. So the net field outside the solenoid on this side, and the other side is equal to zero. It cancels out. Yeah, but other. This point you put, you have a contribution from this, sorry, from here, from here, from here, and maybe from other to the unta sphere bada, unta, unta circle bada. Okay, so you have a contribution for several 
for different ones, canceling them out. Okay, so now we know that the, here the magnetic field in this path should be zero, magnetic field in this path should be zero, and in this path it should be zero. We would only have contribution in this path. So let's try to make for path D1 now, this would be equals to mu naught i enclosed. What have you enclosed now? If I have this situation, so let me redraw it here. <coughs> so I have this imperial loop. This is my imperial loop, which is P1. We have all those currents which are enclosed inside. So what are those currents? So how many loops you have? You have n number of loops. T. So at each, and you have what is the length of this thing? It is. Uh, I will make it small n because. The capital L, it was the length of the whole thing. So how much current would be enclosed in this length, which is small n? So how many currents is enclosed in so I divided by N? This is the current which is enclosed in L, in capital L. Sorry. How many loops you have? So that many currents will be coming out. So that's let's say if you have n numbers here, n number, and each current which is going in is i, i, i. So if you have n number of those things, you would have n into the i. That would be the total current which would be going into the loop. Divide by n, this would give you the current per unit. distance and if I want to find the current only in this distance then what I do I multiply it by small l so that would be the i enclosed so this would be equal to n i divided by l in the small l so that's what I have what is the left hand side so if so the left hand side, if I start from here and I do integrate it on this path counterclockwise. So what would be the magnetic field inside? It is in this direction and the dl would be in this direction or ds would be in this direction. So what you would have for the first term would be equal to the magnetic field which is inside multiplied by this uh, L. But it would have a minus because both are in the opposite direction. So you integrate the derivative of this direction with the derivative of B field opposite direction. Mein. So B dot L to F, it would have a minus. And the other, you, there is no magnetic field in this direction, no magnetic field here, no magnetic field in this direction. So the rest would give you zero contribution effect. And this equals to, okay, there would be a minus sign over there. Because the currents which you are considering within this loop are going into the board and the current which go into the loop into the board are negative currents so we would have a minus sign over there. So if that's the case, this would be equal to L and I by capital L mu naught with a minus here. So L cancels out. And the magnetic field magnitude inside this is equal to mu naught n by l into i. 
What is this? This is the number of loops per unit length, and this has a certain. It is normally denoted by small n. So this would be the magnetic field which would be inside. This I would call as B n. And this would be uniform throughout because if I take my infinity loop like like here or anywhere inside, that this the magnetic field because the right hand side is exactly the same, the left hand side would also be exactly the same. So the field which you would have is within the solenoid would be uniform field with equal magnitude throughout. So what you would have in such a case is a magnetic field which is uniform inside the solenoid. Of course outside it can, at the edges it can vary, but inside it would be uniform in an infinite solenoid. So that's why it will help you that if you have uh, symmetry is the problem, but first we have to look at the symmetry. Or symmetry are be healthy along this this along this line you have a constant magnetic field. So what if I give you such a problem that you have one solenoid like this and another solenoid Say they have different numbers as well. So, so, so that's the situation we have. What would be the magnetic field, let's say, in this region or in this region or in this region and outside? So outside here, outside there, the magnetic field would be zero. So that's something which you already know from the case of the solenoid. So let's try to find out the magnetic field here in this region. So the imperial loop should be something like this. So let's say this current is I, and this current is again I, but in the opposite sense. Uh, this one has the number of loops which you have here is N1, and the number of loops which you have here is N2 per unit length. So what would be the B field here? Let's say in region 1. So the P in region 1 multiplied by L, let's say L is the length of this imperial loop, this is equal to mu naught multiplied by the current enclosed. What is the current enclosed? This is I multiplied by N1 because that's what the density of current and the loops is in the outer region. So what you would have, and because uh, the magnetic field because of this loop would be inside in this direction and it depends on in which direction you are integrating maybe you are integrating along that direction so you would have a minus sign on either side because the current are going in so they would cancel out but what you can say at mu i this will be equal to Okay, this will be N1 by N. Okay, because that's what 
the total length, if you have n1 will be the total number in the same length n. And n2 will be the total number in the other length. Let's say this region is 2. So that in this case, to infinity mu tau cup, then it would be in which direction? So that would be enclosed two types of current a current due to this and a current due to that. Okay? One is coming out of the board, the other is going into the board. So let's say in that case, V multiplied by n, this would be equal to mu naught and uh, one i and one which is the outer one, it is going into the board so it would come with a minus sign and the other one which is coming out of the board would have a plus sign with it. That's multiplied by n so b2 would be equal to mu naught n2 minus n1 into i plus one. True? Any question here? Does it make sense? Huh? <laughs> okay, so just one definition corresponding to the solenoid. So let's say if you have a solenoid like this, which current I is on, and n is the number of loops per unit length, then the magnetic field which is inside is given by mu naught n i, where n is the number of loops per unit length, and i would be the current flowing through. So as we found out. Uh, let's say if this direction is z direction, then I can give it a vectorial form and let's say the vector form is z. And let's say the current is in such a way that the magnetic field is along z axis. So this quantity is has a certain name and this is normally denoted by a certain symbol which is called as h and it is called as magnetic field strength. So you can write B is equal to mu naught H. This is just a constant and this thing already gives you how strong the magnetic field should be. So this is a name which was given by Historically, it was given to it, so it doesn't have any. It's not a force. This thing is, doesn't have a magnitude of force, but this is just a name which is given to it. So, what is the the dimension of it? It would be ampere, which is current into n is the number of turns per unit length. So this would be ampere per meter. That would be the dimension of this quantity h, which we defined over there. So this is just take it as a definition of a certain thing, but it only depends on the current. So higher the current, more the turns, it means that the stronger the field would be inside the solenoid. So just take it there. Does the solenoid field have a radius of But it makes a, the thing is if it is large, then it starts making difference. Because if you have something like this and something like this, so, yeah, in this case, I do frame fields, 
they become more prominent. Yahan pe jab fringe feels are not that prominent because the soul distance is small. So yahan pe you feel it, it doesn't see the fringe field very well. अगर इन्फिनिट है तो ओके इट डजन मैटर अगर इन्फिनिट है चाहे छोटा हो चाहे बड़ा हो इट डजन मैटर ओके सो लेट मी पुट यू अनदर क्वेश्चन व्हाट हैपेंस इफ आई इन सो यू हैव अ कांस्टेंट मैग्नेटिक फील्ड इनसाइड व्हाट हैपेंस इफ आई पुट अ सर्टेन मटेरियल इनसाइड द सॉलिड बॉडी एनी मटेरियल so it can be any type of material but this is nonetheless a certain material which you put it inside so what happens to that material and what would be the field in this case now would it be the same field or would it change so let's try to find out this problem that what happens if you insert a certain put a certain material inside a magnetic field so to answer that question let me come back to the problem that you were dealing in the last week that if you have an atom an atom would have a certain magnetic moment mu and where does those magnetic moment come from so the atom is basically a small small ball magnet it comes from two sources uh, so if you have a proton and you have an electron which is minus surround But because of the orbital motion of this electron around the proton you have a certain momentum uh, with angular momentum which is called as orbital angular momentum and you have a mag and because that orbital angular momentum you have a magnetic moment so that is basically a magnet in itself but that's not the whole story you have another magnetic moment inside the atom and that is that of a spin due to the spin of the electron so that it precesses around it so you have another magnet in the form of a spin then you have u s equals to minus there is a factor of 2 extra here so by e by 2 mp e s this is something this factor of 2 which comes from relativistic quantum mechanics you don't need to know it yet but some just take it as it is this is also called as the g factor so if you have heard the name this is the g factor of the electron so what would be the total magnetic moment of the atom on the atom it would be basically the vector sum of both both of these magnetic moments so if you take an atom and it has a certain magnetic moment uh, you might have contribution from both of them due to the angular motion plus due to the spin motion okay it's a vector addition so No, no, never. We are just saying that we are vectorially adding them. We don't know about their direction yet. Yes. What is mu l? Mu l. That's the magnetic moment due to the orbital motion. So the orbital motion is this motion, and then you have the spin motion. So that's the spin magnet orbital magnetic moment, and because of this, you have spin magnetic moment. So these are the two magnets we have within the same atom. And if you combine both those atoms, <coughs> magnetic both the dipoles, then you get a net dipole magnetic moment, which is the magnetic moment of a whole atom. So if you take, if you think about this material which you have put inside there, any question or this is key. Shall we? Yeah. Okay. So let's take the that material which I have solid solid condensed in. Okay, if it is made of atoms, and those atoms would have magnetic moments, and I can describe those magnetic moments with an arrow. Yes. Huh? 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 Huh?
L appears on the whole orbit, so it's because of the uh, whole atom. So it, it doesn't appear on the nucleus. I have, I have the proton and angular momentum, I have ignored that. Because it's too small because of the larger mass. So this is the case you have. You can have magnetic moments of the atoms inside, and they may be in some random direction initially. So this is the situation, or more or less the situation you can have inside the material which you have put inside. Up. Are they aligned with each other or not? So you may have different conditions depending on which material you have put. So let's say what would be the total magnetic moment for this whole material. So what you can do is just add all those magnetic moments up. So if you do this, so you would have new atoms. So if you add them up for all the atoms, you would get the total magnetic moment. And if you divide it by the volume of this material, whatever block you have taken, then you have a certain quantity which is called as magnetization. So if all of them sum up, if all of them are random, the vector sum would be equals to zero and there would be no magnetization inside the block. But if they add up into a certain net magnetic moment, you would have a net magnetization. So this kind of this magnetization. If I had this empty, empty solenoid, so this would be the field I would have. And I call this as V0. So that's, let's say if you have an empty solenoid and it has a certain magnetic field inside and you are putting that material, which is this one, into that solenoid. So what you have is a magnetic field V0 inside the solenoid and you are putting that cylinder into that magnetic field which is V0. So, so inside, what would be the magnetic field inside? So what you would have is, you would have this V0 inside in the empty space, you would have this V0 and on top of this B0, you would have another magnetic field which would be due to the magnetization of the material which you have, in which you have put that. So, if the magnetic moment in this material, they are aligned, they would give you a certain magnetization, which means that you would have a certain magnetic moment, and if you have a certain magnetic moment, then you would have an extra field in uh, as the other one. So if this material was not there, the field would be V0, but you have put that material, and if that material has some net magnetic moment, it would have a magnetic field of its own. So let's call this magnetic field Vm, which is the magnetic field formed by the magnetic moments inside, and V0 is the magnetic field, which is the external magnetic field, which you have applied to it. So what would be the total magnetic field inside this material? It would be equal to V0 plus the magnetic field of due to the material. So that would be the total magnetic field inside it. Outside it's V0, but inside it would be the sum of these two. Up this Vm, which is the magnetic field of the magnetic moment, it should be related to this magnetization. Because if you have a net magnetization, you have a net field. And so how do you how are they connected? <coughs> they are connected by this relation that this is equal to V, this magnetic field moment is equal to V naught M. We already know what is V naught. This is equal to V naught H. Okay, but this magnetization, it depends on this V naught as well. What do I mean by this? Let's say, you have put those 
magnetic moments inside a magnetic field, what happens to the magnetic moments? So if you have, let's say, the field in this direction, which is B naught, what happens to those magnetic moments? They try to align in the direction. And the stronger this field is, the stronger would be the alignment. So what does it mean? You have that. It in turns depend on X, <coughs> which you have applied. B naught, yeah, H, let's say H, oh my goodness, no. H is due to the solenoid. So it is a, it represents a field. So if that field is strong, the magnetic moments kya karenge? They would align themselves. Or if you magnetization, it will increase. So this M, in turns depend on this H. And how do we explain that dependence? It is equal to a certain quantity multiplied by H. So the higher the H is, the stronger would be this magnetization. And this quantity is called as susceptibility. Or more specifically, magnetic susceptibility of the material. So you can guess that this would depend on what, what kind of material it is. Some material get easily magnetized, other get not magnetized. So this mu would be different for each material. And based on this mu, you can classify different materials in terms of their magnetic properties. What if the susceptibility is a question? What is what if this susceptibility is positive? So if you increase H, the magnetization would increase as well. So what you should expect is kind of a linear response from the magnetic material. True? So I'm just writing the magnitude and not the direction. What if chi is less than zero, you would have a magnetization which would be going negative. So what would this mean? That you B not the first term mean so you have to ask A medium hat. B not agar this direction may so the B M hat it is also in the same direction. But this other And B, if B naught is in this direction, it will be M hat, it is in the opposite direction. But in either cases, what you have is a linear relationship between the external field which you apply, and this is something which you can control. How do you control H? How do you control H? H is basically mu naught into this thing and h is given by n into i. So just by changing the current to it, you can control this magnetic field. Sorry? And n, n, n to change the omega normally, but h is equal to mu n i z. So if you change current, you are changing h. So this h is something which you can change. But this M is something which the material does, it's not good. It's can you say that the magnetic susceptibility is basically BM would be? The Vara said you tie it, then you are saying it. No, it's not. It's not. Okay. So, in either case, you have a linear relationship, and this is called as a linear medium. Such a material is called as a paramagnetic material, and this material is something which is called as diamagnetic material. So most of the most of the stuff you have around here is basically diamagnetic. 
it's not it's not very magnificent. It's that big. So the question is, what what are these magnetization values? Are they small or are they big? So it would depends on Calgar's chi key value. Kya hai. So let me give you the value of chi for certain known materials. So let's say your pair of magnets. So pair of magnets. Of magnets. And pair magnets. So one thing, what would be the unit of chi? What would be the unit of time? Unitless. The empty dimension is the HKB dimension. है. So these two have exactly the same dimension. This means the chi is this is unitless. It's dimensionless. So the paramagnet is, let's say, sodium. Then it is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 6. Copper oxide is, it is 2.6 into 10 to the power minus 4 to aluminum hai, this is 1.7 into 10 to the power minus 5. What are the diamagnet's value? Water is a diamagnet. So this its value is minus 13 into 10 to the power minus 6. Copper is minus 5.5 into 10 to the power minus 6 and so on. So these are the values in this. So what does those values tell you? If you magnetization are produced, which is M, it is much, much, much smaller than the external field you are applying. So normally, the level of vector is this a much smaller vector, which you are either adding into it or either subtracting from it. So this slope, this is a very small slope. But there is a third class of material which are called as ferromagnets and that is very rarely found in nature, it's not, it's not a widely found, only four or five elements have this. For example, iron, nickel, cobalt, uh, germanium, only five, I think I did another one, and germanium and dysprosium. Only these five elements have are ferromagnet. All the rest of the 110 elements are not. There are the ferrous type. So, what are the properties here? What is different between this material and that material? So, let's try to find out. So, if you have H, which is the field which are you are externally applying, and you have and you are measuring magnetization of this material. So, what? you see is something different. So if you increase the external field, the magnetization, it increases non-linearly and then it saturates. That's not a line, it's something else. Okay? So that response is called as non-linear response. Up we control theory, right? Control. The okay. There's a linear control system in this. One is a non-linear control system. The most probably would be linear control. Anyway, so what you have here is the magnetization has a non-linear response. But more important is the values of magnetization you are getting. So what you have the chi head, which is a magnetic sensitivity, which is given by the slope. Now we have M, what is M is equal to chi H. If you take dM by dH, what is this? This is your chi. So that's the slope of this graph. So the slope of graph is changing at each point. It's not constant. So chi is not single value for these medium. And those chi depends on the external field rather. That's the most important thing here. It is constant and it doesn't depend on the field. It depends on the field. So, chi is something 
which is a function of h. Look, the susceptibility. Uh, so susceptibility tells you that if you apply an external field to a material, how much magnetization you can produce inside this medium. So now the question is what are the values of chi for such material as compared to these values. So if you look, of course it depends on it depends on the magnetic field, but just for a rough estimate, the chi's are in the range of 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5. So if you compare these values to this value, you have a plus one here. I haven't forgotten minus. It's a plus, and those values are 10 to the power minus. So there's 10 order of magnitude difference between the magnitude of magnetization you are able to produce in a ferromagnet as compared to a ferromagnet or a diamond. So here values, so if I see where go dono add karu, let's say you may pass diamond, the paramagnet, it will be something like this. If you say a line, it will be something like that. There would be very small values of magnetization you are able to see. So that's why magnet, you are able to produce such strong magnetic fields inside a magnet that you can use it for different applications, so up in different transformers and, and all this stuff employs ferromagnet rather than ferromagnet. Hmm. Hmm. This graph is not the same. So, what if, so you have an external field in this direction. Uh, so, how did you get this graph? You started with a small current through the solenoid and then you increase that current and this is how the magnetization increased. True? What if you start decreasing the current again? Magnetization kya hoi hoi di? It would decrease but it won't come, come back to zero. So the field of zero aega, you would still have some magnetization left inside the material. So the iron alloy ko magnetize kar do, wo magnet rehta hai kabhi dher tak. So that's why. If you magnetize it by putting it in a solenoid or placing it in the vicinity of another magnet, when you magnetize it, you remove the external edge, so it still remains magnetized, so it would have this much magnetization left. If you want to remove the magnetization out of it, what you have to do? You have to apply current in the opposite direction now. Okay? So H do have, then you have to extend H into the negative degree. So kya hoega? Then you would be able to decrease the magnetization further to make it zero. But if you increase the field again, you would magnetize it in the other direction now. Okay? Pehle aapne field this direction mein apply ki, and you have a magnetization, a very large magnetic field in that direction. But now you are reversing the direction, so what happened? The magnetization, if you like, will be reversed. And it would again saturate here. This is called a saturation. It doesn't increase further. And if you have to again go back, this is what curve you get. This curve is called a hysteresis curve. So a magnet, a ferro magnet, it remembers its history. What do I mean by this? So it remembers, here let's say field up increase key, up in field to zero key and left it. But it remains this history, I magnetized was the belly and I'm still magnetized. <laughs> so magnet do remember. <laughs> like this or why the material act like that? What, what's the difference between them? So let me point out just briefly what, what is the difference between these three different classes of material and you can read it up yourself. 
So start with the diamagnet. So diamagnets mostly would have atoms with no mag magnetic moments on them. They won't have any magnetic moments on them. Consider you have an electron hole like electron bond. What will happen to you? One electron up and spin. One electron down and spin. What will happen to you? Zero will happen. Let's say if it is in S-shell, what will happen to you? What will happen to you? What will happen to you? Capital N, which is a magnetic moment. That is zero because L is given by N is given by N plus 1 H bar square root. This is a magnitude. So that S-shell will have passed L zero and capital L is zero. Okay? So you can have many different scenarios in which you don't have any magnetic moment. This material of external field of light that they, it produces a very small magnetic field in the opposite direction. And why it does so? Any idea? We haven't done that, but it's something which comes from lenses law. If you, if you remember lenses law, again, Agibas, with current head, if you apply an external field to it, those current opposes itself. So that's what this opposition does there. Although it's a very small effect. This other one, which is a paramagnet, what happens in there that you have those this condition, you have magnetic field moments in random directions. And each neighbor is independent of each other. When you apply a magnetic field to it, so they kind of try to arise in the direction of the magnetic field and you get in it. But the effect is not very strong because all of them are random and it's not easy to completely change their direction on the yes. Yes. It's been over there. And this gets slightly aligned in the direction of the field when you apply a field. Yes. Repentant thing. Catches? Who create goes out there? Thodi deri. Like when you apply an external field, who goes out there? Because of lens is not. Because the imagine our class atom has just made current. But those currents are not producing any magnetic moment. But when you apply an external field to it, what you are doing, you are inducing another EMF inside which you are spreading. You can oppose the range of external field. So you create a small magnetic moment in the other direction. Okay, but in the ferro magnet, you have a different scenario. Just like I was, you have magnetic moments such that your neighboring magnetic moments, they are aligned in the same direction. So each magnetic moment it is strongly connected with the neighboring magnetic moment. So the ray is direction may align that to south or the direction may align hoga, south or the direction may align hoga, and so on. So you have different such. So called domains inside a ferromagnet in the same direction. And the reason is, for example, if you take a magnet, a bar magnet, the upper north end, and you take another one, the upper north end. If you try to bring them closer, kya ho ya? they try to flip around. They can be experiment the ega. They try to flip around. They try to flip around to north to have So if you have Let's say a, big, a domain in this direction, this domain would flip the neighboring direction. So normally they are opposite direction. The neighboring domain is in the opposite direction. So let's say, I haven't done it very nice work here, but you might have <laughs> something like this. Most probably. Independent view of them because there is something which is called an exchange of direction, which is a slightly, uh, like, I don't know if you would study it, but if you are in physics, you would do it uh, studying in condensed matter physics. Which is con exchange of direction is between two neighboring spins, uh, and it is an exchange of electron which happens between them, which align the neighboring electron with, uh, with one atom to another. So that's what happens. Uh, it's a property of spin one half particles. Okay, I, I, I don't know. So what you have is a very strong alignment of the magnetic fields 
which are neighboring. So if you apply an external tweak which is in this direction, for example, what would happen? Then this would have lower energy because and this one which is opposite, it would try to align itself. But this, so what happens? That this one, this thing goes up. So you have border pair of magnetic moments. They align in the magnetic field. Or given like that, well, because बढ़ जाता है, increase होता है. Simply those may align in the direction. और ये जो opposite align है, ये decrease होता है. The more you increase the field, the more this gets bigger, bigger. Uh, and finally, what you have is all of them are completely aligned. That's where you can't increase the magnetization further than that. अब जब आप field हटाते हो, ठीक है? Why would they like to come back? Nothing. Because you don't have a field, nothing would try to do. Unless you apply a field in the opposite direction, they would try to come back. So that's why you have this. Okay, I think I would like to stop here.